This episode is made possible by Stack Adapt. Need digital creatives fast and don't have time or resources to hire a design team? With Stack Adapt, you can build captivating creatives to take your brand from your idea bank to your audience, straight to them. The creative builder in Stack Adapt will save you time, cut costs, and simplify your creative workflow. If you want to learn more, you can go to go.stackadapt.com slash creative builder. And there is a video there explaining everything you need to know. Just trying to figure out this is like a win-win situation for like both agencies and for both of us to just make sure that we produce this self-serve tool that gives them the freedom and the ability to produce ad at any given point in time and do not have to rely on a, like a person or an agency to be able to make variations and versions out of it. Hey gang, it's Tuesday, February 27th. I'm well aware of how I sound. Bill, Arjav and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Stack Adapt. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by two folks. Let's meet them. We start with our principal analyst covering everything in the UK, based in the country as well. Makes sense. On the South Coast, it's Bill Fisher. Hello, Marcus. How are you doing? Hey, fella. Very good, sir. Very good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Very nice. Also host of our Around the World show, which uh, has this episode once a month, came out yesterday. Uh, we're also joined by the senior product manager for Stack Adapt, uh, Arjav Thakur. Welcome, Arjav. Thanks, Marcus. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Very good, sir. Yeah, of course. Absolute pleasure. Welcome to the show. So, folks, let's get to know these guests a little bit better before we start the episode. We, of course, begin with a speed intro. So here we go, gents, five questions. We move quick. Arjav, I'll start with you for the first one. Where are you from and based? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Arjav. I was born and raised in India, uh, but from the age of 18, I've been living in Melbourne and UK for a while. But since last few years, I've settled in Toronto, Canada. Very nice. Bill? I'm originally from the northwest of England, but as you mentioned, I'm about as far away from that as you can get without crossing any major body of water. I live on the south coast near Brighton. Very good, very good. Uh, secondly, Bill, what do you do in a sentence? Uh, Annoy Marcus regularly. Uh, yeah. Apart I, from that. There is that. Um, I research, read around everything media marketing related in Western Europe, then synthesize it into actionable insight for our clients. Ah, uh, Jeff. Um, imagine me being like the Bugs Bunny curtain, playing in all the positions in basketball. And uh, we look at the business, <laughs> we look at technology, we work with cross-functional teams and build pretty cool features for our platform, making sure that our customers are happy and the company is happy too. Very nice. Good visual. Uh, what's your morning drink, sir? Uh, I would say like a traditional Indian chai with a bit of ginger, mint and spice mix. Very good, Bill. I'm going to annoy the purists here. I start the day with a cup of black decaf instant coffee. Instant, fine. Decaf, no, Bill. People hate instant. By people, I mean Paul Werner. Favourite book, Bill, of all time? It's one I just finished reading. It's by a British comedian called Bob Mortimer. It's called The Satsuma yes. Complex, and it made me laugh out loud. Ah, oh, he's, he's fantastic. National treasure. How about you, Arjo? I was going to say the Harry Potter books, but I recently read The Thursday oh. Murder Club from Regent Osman. Uh, I think that's one of the favourites all time. Yeah, Very good. And Arjo, if you had to move... If you got kicked out of your home city, where you live, where would you go? I would say Cambridge, England. I used to work there a few <laughs> years ago. It's <laughs> oh, one of my favorite sir. towns. Uh, it's pretty nice, beautiful, good architecture. Pretty, I would say, cozy, slow living. Uh, I would love that. Yeah. Arjav wins. Yes. That is the answer we were looking for, Arjav. That's right close to where I grew up. Beautiful part of the world. Bill, how about you? There's no real answer that will beat that, so there's no real point of you going, but for the sake of being fair. What if I said Cambridge? No, you'd just be copying him okay. at this point. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting, Arjav, you said you lived in Melbourne for a bit. I lived in Australia for a year, uh, loved the way of life out there. I actually was tempted to get an employer sponsor whilst I was out there. It was on offer, but for some reason I was tempted back to the grey, gloomy UK. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it would be Australia. And if you were to push me for a city, I'd say Brisbane. I lived there for three months. I enjoyed it. Very nice, sir. Very nice. All right, there are two guests. We start with today's facts before we get into the episodes. Today's fact is, uh, who's the oldest person to have ever lived? Quick guess from each of you, gents. How old do you think is the oldest person? Is this from the Bible or something? No, recent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 100, I'll go 120 then. All right, Jav? 110. 110. That's what I would have said, or l way lower, to be honest. 
But the oldest person ever to have lived, whose age could be authenticated, was a French woman called Jean Louise Calment, who was 22 years old. Sorry, that's not right. That's too young. <laughs> who was 122 years old when she died in 1997. So if you met her in like 1996 or whatever, and you were like, oh, you know, when were you born? 1875. Wow. Shocking. So I did pretty well. I, I was two years you old. So you were I never would have gone that high. But yeah, women in France, they can expect to live to 85 years on average. So Miss Calment, uh, she lived for another 37 years after hitting 85. I'm just trying to get to 45, you know? Jeez, amazing. Just remarkable. Anyway, today's real topic, how building creatives is changing. So in today's episode, first in the lead, we'll cover how creating creatives is evolving. Then for another news, we'll discuss what replaces cookies and marketers' gen AI priorities. But we start, of course, with the lead. So Arjav, start with the today. What's going on at the moment and what you're seeing when it comes to the main problems folks are facing when they're trying to build creatives? I can think of a few in the last few months, we've been talking to a lot of clients and agencies. And uh, one of the few things that came to mind is like creative automation and lack of resources. A lot of brands and agencies do not have um, in-house creative team or nor have the resources to build one. Advertising space, as we know, is like changing rapidly, becoming more and more complex, competitive for agencies and brands. So how do you automate to keep up with the demands while maintaining your costs and resources in check? And the second side of the coin is there are like a very lack of options in terms of self-serve to tools to produce ads at a level of scale and quality. So a lot of clients, especially mid-sized agencies that we've spoken with, are trying to innovate in the creative building space, but do not see a lot of avenues that are simple, easy on the wallet, and scalable to match the overgrowing demands. And I would say the second few problems I've seen across is the time-consuming aspect of it. Agencies always rely on third-party creative services to build ads, and it can be both expensive and time-consuming. If you have a fast-approaching, uh, let's say, event like a Black Friday sale or Boxing Day promotions and stuff, and you need to promote like creatives mm -hmm. ASAP, it might be difficult for you to build quality ads quickly while it's easy on your wallet. The turnaround times can be really long, and then there is a the billing aspect. So you can also get billed on how many ads you build for how many clients, for how many brands, the number of variations, number of versions and stuff. So this adds a lot of burden from like the agency standpoint and in terms of the cost they have to bear. These are like huge roadblocks for them. The lack of tools mm -hmm. is what I'm seeing uh, a lot of the biggest issues for agencies at the moment. Yeah, and, and just Arjav's already alluded to a lot of what I would say actually, but cost and, and talent, I think, are some of the big issues as well. So sort of zooming out if you're doing in-house creative, attracting and retaining talent, certainly coming from a European perspective and specifically a UK perspective. We're in a bit of a state economically at the moment and cost as well if you're getting your creative external creative, the costs for that can be incredibly prohibitive. So uh, as Arjav says, you know, being able to get something that automates this for you and, and is very light touch is a really, really good idea at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I liked also what you said. I mean, there's planning ahead, which ideally is the case uh, when you're thinking about advertising, but there's also, it sounds like this tool gives you, giving you the ability to pivot quickly. If you see that, you know, oh, I actually want to go in a different direction. A lot of the time before these tools existed, you would have been like, okay, we don't have time to create it and pivot and actually go with something that's going to be much more culturally relevant or, or whatever. And so it, that, that uh, immediacy, that ability to pivot quickly, I think is also really important. So speaking to the, the motivations of the Stackadat team to build the creative builder, which is the tool that you have, talk to us a bit about that and the gap that you saw in the programmatic space that this tool fills. Yep, absolutely. I think this is, I would say the answer could be in three folds. When we were looking up into like what sort of tools that we should be building, what are the core problems you wanted to solve? First of all, we wanted to be inclusive. By that, I mean 
the tool that we build is not just scalable, customizable, and user-friendly, but we wanted to bring this out so that everybody and anybody on the agency level can use this. You don't really have to be like, you know, a design expert or have technical prowess to be able to use these kind of tools and still be able to produce quality ads in multiple size aspect ratios in bulk. So we do not want to gatekeep any technology. We wanted to open this out for everybody on the agencies and brands level, especially small and mid-sized agencies. And we wanted to strike that balance where we let our clients build ads with enough customization options so that they can adhere to the brand guidelines, but also not overwhelm them with lots of different options out there. And the overall idea was to just ship out ads as quickly as possible, but do not compromise on quality. And I would say the second option going into the future would be like scalability. The Creative Builder allows users to produce like customized ads in bulk, which is what our primary goal was. And to be able to produce ads quickly and immediately, you can add them to your campaigns. If it's one ad, 10 ads, 100 ads, you can think of anything. But on top of that, clients can also store, host, and manage all of the ads on our creatives library, which is like one single space on the platform to manage everything in terms of creatives. So from ad production to hosting to management, all can be done from a single location without like, you know, spending a single penny on top of what you're paying to stack it up, which is what like our goal was. And eventually it all connects to like, you know, providing self-serve options and giving control and freedom back to the users, to our agencies. And so brands have now the ability to produce ads at their own will, at their own pace, add their own customization, figure out what they want to build, how they want to build. They can just simply put like their assets, add their content, add styling, and publish the ads immediately. And all of this without relying on external teams with a hefty price tag. Mm -hmm. I have a question, because this sounds fantastic, it's like almost democratization of the process, right? Um, are there guardrails in place? Is there any way that, that control is built in? Because, you know, if you're allowing everybody to make any changes rapidly, is there any risk that kind of control of the brand can be lost? There is no particular risk, I would say, but it, it mostly comes to user discretion at the end of the time. So there could be different yeah. users who want to use these tools on the agency and brand level. We can have controls on like user level or brand level just to make sure that, you know, whatever the brand and agencies are producing are all well within the guidelines of what is approved. We also have a quality team on our side to make sure that all the ads that are being produced are all within the quality and the regulations. But even on the brand level, they can add all the customization they need. But at the end, we also allow like a approval options and stuff so that, you know, you can also reach out to your clients to make sure the ads look nice and get approved and then get published to our platform. So there are different ways to manage about it, but we just don't want to put any hard, I would say, guardrails around the production process. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk through an example of how someone has used the Creative Builder. What does this look like in practice? One of them, I was just chatting with a client recently on a feedback call. Uh, they mentioned this use case. It was near like Boxing Day sales on uh, December 26. It was a, a website that has a retail e-commerce store online who sells like accessories and jewelries and stuff. And they already had a, I would say, Boxing Day sale event plan for certain rings or certain bracelets. But at the last minute, they had an issue in production. Some items were out of sale and they had to quickly pivot and like make new ads because they now have to promote a different kind of product with a two days notice. And they reached out to our team we introduced them to the creative builder because it was just one month since it was launched timing was perfect and they were able to build those ads in a matter of like let's say half an hour they produced i would say over three dozen ads with different rings different accessories that they wanted to pivot to and were able to add them to campaigns worth like 400k in budget so i would say like Two main things of on their minds was the amount of time it took for them to produce the ads and quality ads and they had the control of what they wanted to build mm -hmm. You said you have a, maybe one more example for us as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was another company with, uh, I would say, rooftop finishing. So like they were managing like roofs and stuff in certain houses. And this is something which is kind of an unfortunate because there was like a storm in Ontario a few months ago. And then these particular companies wanted to reach out to clients who had issues with their house, their roofs gone over like with the storm and everything. They wanted to produce ads as quickly as possible, getting local data in kept and be introduce Creative Builder to them as well. They were able to produce those ads, just making sure that they are producing ads in a timely manner. This was due to like an unforeseen event, but they were able to like, you know, mm -hmm. save that time, produce ads, reach out to right users. And they saw a lot of success because a lot of the people had their uh, issues with their houses. They were able to fix those houses and they were able to reach to right people. If you didn't have the creatives in right space, timing is very key in kind of these kind of situations. So we wanted to make sure that yeah. the most critical part of the advertising campaign, the creative part, that was done in a matter of minutes and they set up the campaigns and they just ran with it. 
All right, let's end the lead by talking about some of the problems that you anticipate in the medium term future for Creative Building. We talked a bit about uh, the problems that you saw recently, which is why the Creative Builder uh, exists. But looking down the rows, months, maybe a year or two in the future, what are some of the problems you anticipate? I would say the first one would be how all of our clients and their businesses are unique. They have unique requirements. Uh, they have unique demands on what sort of advertising creatives that they wanted to build. How do they want to reach out to users? I would say the variety of options, be it just different kind of creative templates or multi-channel solutions. So right now we have, I would say, Creative Builder for display ads. I'm already seeing a trend growing where people are asking for a similar self-serve tool for video building ads, um, audio ads, where you can just generate a script. You can add an audio track and you can just produce an audio ad immediately or a video ad where you can add interactivity layers on top. I'll make it a shoppable video or add a video topper in the beginning, make it a bit more interactive. Mm -hmm. So video and CTV channels that we've seen are growing at a rapid pace. They're right next to display when it comes to the top growing channels. And I'm seeing a lot of requirements because producing those ads are even more complex and even more time consuming and cost ineffective. So if we were to be able to put that onto self-serve platform, that's going to relieve a lot of the cost on agency side to be able to produce ads easily using like self-serve tools. And the second biggest thing mm -hmm. I'm seeing right now is the wave of generative AI in the whole uh, realm of business, especially in the creative side. If you're just adding like content manually. A lot of the, I would say clients, agencies have content ready, but you, at some point you're going to reach creative fatigue. You will want to like, you know, make sure the creatives are new, fresh, looking up for like new demographics and stuff. So introducing generative AI on top of it, which will be like, okay, suggest some alternate headlines, suggest some new descriptions. I can write in a prompt and you give me yeah. a complete script mm -hmm. out of it and stuff. So that saves a lot of time, gives them a new perspective. So integrating that technology in just like, you know, text generation, content generation, image generation, image scaling and stuff. So those are some of the, I would say, emerging fields I see in terms of creative building aspects, ad production aspects, and how do we make sure that it's scalable? And how do we make sure we save further more time by introducing more auto to it. I think that's the key area of focus, I think, in the midterm area for the creative builder stuff. If I can just go off on a tangent from this, because talking about video, that's what I would have thought would be interesting to talk about, certainly as Gen AI and as we've seen with Sora going on in the background. I thought it was quite interesting listening to OpenAI CEO Sam Altman last month at the World Economic Forum. And he, he admitted, I think, for the first time that uh, the next wave of Gen AI, and I assume he was referring to video, that would consume vastly more power than expected. And I just wonder if this is something that's bubbling under the surface, because I mentioned this because I'm writing about sustainability and advertising at the moment. And as generative video comes to the fore, I can just see emissions going through the roof. And I, I just wonder if this is a problem that we'll have to get to grips with across, I mean, not just in creative building, but across creative full stop and across ad tech full stop as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that people might want to get there, but they can't because you have to get there sustainably, so to speak. Very nice, gents. That's all we've got time for, for the lead today in other news. What are marketers Gen AI priorities for 2024 and goodbye cookies? Hello? Question mark. Story one. What are marketers Gen AI priorities for 2024? Trishla Oswal of Adweek writes that as the Gen AI hype cycle cools down from the launch of ChatGPT last November, marketers 2024 expectations for the technology extend beyond simple chats to decoding client briefs, gathering real-time campaign performance data and cleaning up reams of unstructured data. But Arjav, I'll start with you. What do you think are marketers Gen AI priorities for the year? So I think last year we saw a lot of products hit the market, but this time this is the year for execution. And I'm thinking about two major themes. One is about AI agents to be able to optimize your day-to-day -day jobs operations, but more into like hyper targeting or analysis into like your campaign strategy, understand which ads or which campaigns work with what kind of an audience. And the second one being like the creative tech. How do I produce creatives using the 
exact information from AI as to which creatives, which campaigns will work better, what element should I be using in my creatives. And in the end, just help me get rid of the creative fatigue to be able to keep sure my creatives are refreshed, give me new insights and figure out the areas of the platform or the audiences that I didn't know. But we can analyze that using the campaign historical data, performance data, demographics data, and suggest it to users that, hey, maybe these elements in the creatives will work better with the audience you're targeting as opposed to this one, and then help me improve the campaign performance afterwards. Mm -hmm. Bill? Yeah, I agree with Arjav. It's about execution this year. I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle. Execution in terms of ensuring you're using the technology ethically and legally. So I think regulation will be a big thing this year. Plus, you're going to need to use it professionally or competently. You know, you don't want to damage a brand because you just let Gen I go ahead and create any old junk. So just figuring out how to use this technology properly and execute properly will be key this year. Yeah. Story two. Goodbye cookies. Hello. Who knows? The IAB Tech Lab recently said that the industry is not ready for Google's post-cookie solution, the Privacy Sandbox. Privacy Sandbox Senior Product Director Victor Wong told AdAge the IAB Tech Lab's pleas for features similar to cross-site tracking don't fit under the new privacy landscape. Our Daniel Konstantinovich notes Google has punted on phasing out third-party cookies multiple times after advertisers raised concerns, but after it got the ball rolling this January by turning off cookies for 30 million Google users, that's about 1% of them, it is facing renewed calls for delays. Bill, I'll start with you for this one. What's your take on the impending cookie deprecation coming in Q3? Uh, yeah, goodbye cookies, hello instability. I think obviously the, the <laughs> privacy sandbox, if you said, is not really ready, or at least it won't be to the satisfaction of many in the industry. So I think I think what will be interesting to see will be the growth in advertising that doesn't rely on cookies or whatever their replacement might be. We've been tracking retail media ad spending growth, for example, and we've seen huge growth in all the territories we cover, North America, Europe, Latin America, APAC. The vast ways of first party data that these retail properties sit on are clearly reaping the benefits of the cookie deprecation. So it'll be interesting to see how much of an advantage they can take in this uh, uncertain period for ad targeting. Mm -hmm. Ah, Jeff. Yeah, to um, echo Bill's point, I do see, uh, I would say, a genuine concern for advertisers over like the transition cost, time commitment, and most importantly, like to be able to reach the right users at the right time. But I'm already seeing a shift towards like a cookie-less targeting in terms of like contextual. 95% of advertisers place at least some priority on finding solutions for cookie-less future, and over 66% believe that contextual targeting will be more important in a cookie-less environment. So the trend is growing. There is much more uh, awareness outside, and I think the future is is bright regardless of cookies going off because advertising is here to stay and it works so despite like google's reservation and advertiser reservation i think there are other options of like third-party data and uh, i would say first-party data that people can utilize right now i'm seeing a lot of trend over there and contextual targeting so i think there are multiple options that we can choose from mm -hmm. yeah it's gonna be interesting to see as we get closer and closer um how people do move over, whether they wait to the last second and then have a bit of a shock to the system because cookies still heavily used. There was some data from 33 across 80 to 90% of US programmatic ad buyers across all industries still using cookies versus cookie alternatives. Of course, they wait to the last second. They always yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, GDPR. All right, that's all we've got time for for this episode. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Arjev. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Bill. Lovely chat. Happy to be here today. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Bill. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Oh, Jav, nice to speak with you. Yes, indeed. Thanks to Victoria, who edits the show. James, who's been known to get his copy edit on. Stuart, who runs the hell out of the team. And Sophie, who can't help but crush social media. And thanks to everyone for listening to the Behind the Numbers daily and e-marketer podcast made possible by Stack Adapts. You can hang out with Sarah Lebo tomorrow, who's, of course, the host of our Reimagining Retail show, as she speaks with... Ariel Fager, Blake Drosh, and Sky Cannabis, all about our February most interesting retailer ranking. Hey.